This morning we begin a brand new series, and for the next four weeks it's called Overcome. We're going to be talking about a guy who had to overcome a lot in his life. Now the Bible is full of people who've had to overcome all sorts of obstacles and issues. They've had cultural issues, there were job issues, there were family issues, there were uh, financial issues, there were all sorts of issues in Scripture, and the life that we're going to look at uh, for the next four weeks actually had issues in nearly all of these areas. The list of people in Scripture that have gone through some terrible things is pretty long. I think if we went through uh, person by person, we could say that uh, there have been some awful things that have happened in the Bible to God's faithful people. But there is one account that covers so much, and a person has gone through nearly every issue uh, that we're going to cover. Uh, this account uh, that we're going to talk about, that we're going to hear about, is most likely one that we covered maybe in uh, Sunday school or maybe in vacation Bible school. But now as we turn to it as adults, uh, the, the accounts that we read about seem to hit a little harder. We can't imagine going through something like what this guy went through. Through. So we are going to turn our attention for the next four weeks and take an in-depth look at the life and trials of Joseph. Now for clarity's sake, this is the Joseph we find in Genesis, in the very beginning of the Bible. It is not the Joseph that we talk about at Christmas time in relation to Jesus' family. I've had that conversation in our confirmation classes when we come to Jesus' birth and say, wait a minute, we covered Joseph already. He was way back in the beginning of the Bible. Well, there are actually two Joseph. So the story of Joseph that we're going to be turning to is in the book of Genesis. Now this story of Joseph has been retold again and again and again and again. Uh, it's been made almost famous and most probably most popular in pop culture with a uh, Broadway play that was written called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with the music and score written by uh, someone you may know uh, by, the go by the name of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, it's a huge, huge hit on Broadway. There's also been a made-for-TV series on the life and times of Joseph. It, it was back in the 90s, and uh, it was on cable TV, and you can probably find it on YouTube. Um, but all that to say is that this account is very high on drama. That there are a lot of things in this story that are high on drama. And it has been a story that has captivated people from almost the beginning of time, from the oral tradition that was passed down all the way to the time of Moses uh, as he started to write these accounts out as God inspired him. And now we get it here with us today in the 21st century. Uh, now, this uh, life of Joseph is pretty important. In fact, it's so important that the first book of the Bible, the Genesis, uh, has a lot of material on the life of Joseph. The book of Genesis is 50 chapters. Chapters, a very nice round even number, right? Now, the story of Joseph covers from chapter 37 on. There are 13 chapters on the life and trials of Joseph. Now, if my math is correct, and fortunately I have a few math experts here, um, if my math is correct, that is over 25% of the opening book of the Bible <coughs> devoted to one life, the life of Joseph. It's an important story to tell. It's an important story to get the details right. It's an important story in the life of the redemptive history of God. And it's covered as such. Now, prior to Genesis chapter 37, we read about the hot mess that is Joseph's family. Now, you're not going to see that title in any of the headings of your Bible, the hot mess of Joseph's family. You're not going to see that at all. But if you read uh, after Genesis 25, uh, you'll find the accounts of Isaac and then Jacob and Esau. And then a little bit later, we get Joseph. Now, this family is a mess for numerous reasons. And one of them being that Jacob... Joseph's dad has stolen the birthright and firstborn blessing from his brother Esau. Remember way back in vacation Bible school or way back in, uh, in a Sunday school when we covered this or maybe when you covered it e maybe years ago uh, where Jacob stole Esau's birthright and his blessing from his dad Isaac. Remember way back as Isaac was getting older 
and Isaac's health was failing him, Jacob dressed up like Esau and had some of the characteristics that Esau had. He put some hair on his arms and, and covered his face and with the help of his mother actually made Isaac's favorite meal. And so Jacob goes in dressed as Esau and says, Dad, I'm here, um, I'm here for my blessing. And Isaac, not being able to see him, being in poor health, gives it to him. Esau catches wind of this and clearly is not happy. So Jacob flees town. We fast forward a little bit and Jacob has spent several years outside of town. He's hooked up with one of the local farmers there and he has uh, found a family that he'd like to marry into. And so he, he sees this youngest daughter of this, uh, of this guy and he says, uh, her name's Rachel, and he says, I'd like to marry Rachel. And dad says, okay, great, you're going to work for me for seven years. Okay, we're going to do that. So Jacob works for seven years. When the time comes, the farmer says, great, um, I'm going to give you one of my daughters, but it's not the one you really were looking for. So he gives his, uh, Jacob Leah. He says, I can't marry off my youngest before I marry off my oldest, so you're going to get Leah. And Jacob's like, oh man, come on. He says, what do I got to do now? You got to work seven more years. Oh, all right. So Jacob worked seven more years to marry Rachel. In between all that, Jacob has children with Leah's servant and Rachel's servant. There's a lot of children, a lot of wives, a lot of, a lot of things going on here. Just to be clear, we got a chart to let you know what happened here. Okay, you see Re Leah, and, uh, and there's Leah's servant, Zilpha, and there's Rachel, and there's Rachel's servant, Vilha, and then inside of all that, we've got all of the kids and their names, all right? And if you look to number 12, way back down the line, there's Joseph, okay? There's our, there's our little family chart. So just to be clear, Jacob, Joseph's dad, has four baby mamas, 13 children, and to make matters worse for Joseph... His dad has said, guess what, son? You're my favorite, and I'll make this very clear by giving you this coat of many colors that you can wear around to show everybody that you are the absolute favorite, and, and you're going to wear it around. It's going to be absolutely wonderful, and it's not going to draw any negative uh, attention to yourself from the other siblings. You're going to be just fine. Now, as we look at this, we can certifiably say this family is a hot mess. <laughs> Now, before you say, wait, wait a minute, these guys are in the Bible, that seems a little disrespectful, please know that I hold our sacred text in the highest regard. This has been my life work in studying the Bible, interpreting the Bible, then teaching it to children, students, and adults. And what I've learned through this is that the Bible teaches us about God and his ways and his character and his attributes. It also teaches us about the people that God uses. So while, yes, we can uh, laugh a little bit at how awkward family meals would have been with this family and, and the four wives and 13 kids, I wanted to point out how silly this is, not in judgment of the people we read, but because I want you to realize this this morning. Don't think for a second that your family is so messed up that God can't use you and yours. Don't think for a second that your family is so screwed up, so messed up that God can't use you and yours. The temptation is to look at our situation, look at the family members around us and go, nope, there is no way God is using this mess. But that is just not true. In the family we just highlighted, in Jacob's family, God used this group to start a nation. And not just any nation, God's nation, his nation. A little bit later in the story, we see that God changes uh, Joseph's dad's name from Jacob to Israel. And if you remember, uh, those 12 sons that Jacob has become the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a really important family in God's redemptive history. But it started out kind of as a mess. And it shows us that regardless of where we're at, regardless of how messed up we think our family is, God can use it. We point out how crazy this seems, but don't forget that there's a point here. 
that God uses broken people like you and me for his plan, for his purposes. That even if our families aren't perfect and even if our families aren't the, the glowing spectacle of, of God's grace and right, righteousness, God can still use us if we're willing. He uses broken people. And there's a huge difference now compared to the Old Testament. As God has come in the person of Jesus and he sent his Holy Spirit, which we celebrated a couple of weeks ago, and God has washed us clean to do his redemptive work, to go out and share the gospel of Jesus and the message of hope and redemption. He says, all of your families, your broken mess and all, go and share the gospel and show how much you've been redeemed, even in your mess, even if your family seems very broken, full of heartache, hard times. Go out and share and show what God has done. Now, we set the stage to dig a little bit deeper in the life and trials of Joseph. We see in his family's a little bit of a mess. So we're going to turn to scripture here. We start it in Genesis chapter 37. It's going to be up on the screen. We're going to read a couple chunks of this today. And this is really one of the first accounts we get of Joseph and we meet him and see what he's like. Uh, we start in verse 5. It says this. It says, One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up. And your bundles all gathered round and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So do you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon, Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen. I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars, which would be my brothers, bowed low before me. At this time, he told the dream to his father as well as his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks to Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring a report, or bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. Two things to point out as we open up this uh, first account that we get of Joseph. And the first is that if you have dreams like this, there might be a softer way to tell your family than what Joseph has done here. This is not exactly how you win friends and influence people. Say, hey, I had a dream and everyone before me is going to bow before me. Okay, so just there's a softer way to tell our families of what's going on. Second is that Jacob, his father, has not done Joseph any favors here, sending him to check on his brothers, these same brothers who hated him, who hated him even more, who were just told of this dream that Joseph has and probably weren't real happy about it. Because remember, he's got this coat that says, now I'm dad's favorite, and now I'm having these dreams that you all are going to bow before me. It's not great, not great situation for Joseph, but there's something to glean from this, and it is this, that our family sometimes will not understand how God is moving in our hearts and minds. That sometimes our families will not understand how God is moving. Now again, there's a softer way to tell our families what's going on, but sometimes they will just not grasp what God is nudging you to do. Sometimes for our families, it'll be very hard to understand what God is doing in our lives. I remember the first time I even had the thought of being called into church ministry, into being a pastor. And I remember coming home and sitting mom and dad on the couch and, and saying, you know, I, I, think, I think God may be doing something here. I, I think I may be called to be a pastor. 
And, and there was kind of a big pregnant pause. And they went, okay, what does that mean? I said, that's a great question. I have no idea, but I think God has an idea of what it means to be a pastor. I think you do some talking and you work with people. And, and I, there are a couple things that were clear about this. Is one, I had to go to school. And two, I needed a whole lot of school um, because of who I am. I, I, just, I just needed to know what scripture was saying. I'd seen too many people in my hometown mess up and lead people astray because they just had not taken the time to really dive into his word. So I knew it included a whole lot more school than what I had. But after that, there wasn't much clarity. There wasn't much that I really understood about being a pastor. I didn't know how hard it was going to be. I didn't know the difficult times that were going to be ahead. The uncertainty of knowing where God was going to lead next. My family had a lot of questions. Some questions were great. Some questions were okay. Some questions were really silly. But I didn't have a whole lot of clarity. I couldn't answer their questions, but I knew God was doing something. I knew God was up to something. Now, maybe for us, as we go to our families, it's not clear how God is going to lead and guide. But we don't have to have necessarily all of the answers. We trust in what God is going to do. And sometimes our family will not understand how God is moving in our hearts. Now when it's not clear, when we don't have that clarity, it can be pretty frustrating. It can be really hard as we try to move forward to accomplish the task that God has put in our heads. And when we don't have the answers, when we don't have the clarity, it leads to discouragement. It leads to doubt. We either end up giving up on what God has called us to do, or we're so discouraged, we put it off to the side and say, I'll do that later when I've got time, or maybe when my family's not such a mess, or, or maybe when I've got my finances figured out. But God says, keep going. God says, keep going. And as we read here in our text, when we find adversity, when we don't have the clarity, when we're not sure what to do next, we just stay faithful. And Joseph, being faithful to his father, takes a step. May not be a great step as we're going to read, but he's going to take a step. And sometimes we run into family members and sometimes we run into discouragement that want to knock us down, that come against us. They don't want to see us succeed. And that's what we read about in the next section. Genesis chapter 37. This is verse 18 and following. So Joseph heads out, and when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Doesn't sound real good for our guy Joseph. Now notice as we make a brief pit stop here in the text before we move on, the family, mainly the brothers, uh, have already planned something even before Joseph has arrived. They saw him off in the distance, they recognized him, and they proceeded to make plans to kill him. Now notice this wasn't a fist fight that's turned wrong and gone worse. Notice this wasn't an actual animal attack. No, this was a premeditated plan for murder to stop once and for all their father's favorite in Joseph. As we make this brief pit stop here, we need to see that sometimes the premeditated plan is just around the corner. Sometimes the premeditated plan is just around the corner. Good or bad, someone else might have a plan for our destruction. My assumption is that Joseph had no idea what was coming. Now, that may tell us a little bit about Joseph and his lack of picking up on social cues because his brothers hated him. Because if he knew that the destructive plan was coming, what do you think he should have done? Run away. That's our natural instinct. Say, I'm not going to run into that plan. My brothers hate me, and I'm just going to run off. Okay, that is our natural instinct. When we know a destructive plan is coming, we don't say, yep, I'm just going to keep walking into this awful situation. I know it's terrible, but I'm going to keep going. We don't just keep mowing the grass when the tornado is coming. <laughs> we don't do that. We go the other way. Now, when this guy was asked, his response was, I had an eye on it. <laughs> this is not what we do. 
My friends, hopefully as you know, whether it's the plan of destruction or just hard times in our lives, adversity comes out of nowhere. Usually we don't have a plan on it. It's not something we wake up thinking about. It's a something we have to adjust to. Something we have to adapt to. In our account this morning, Joseph had one thing he had to adapt to, and that was trying not to be killed. Now I know many of you, many of you have had to make major life adaptations. You've had to change course. You've had certain dreams and certain plans and you've had to take a left turn or a right turn because of the adversity that has been right in front of you. It wasn't planned. It wasn't how you dreamed. But you had to adapt. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I am terrible when I have to change plans. When adversity comes, I'm just awful at it. Because when I have a plan... Even if the plan is only a week old or a day old or even if the plan is an hour old, if I've got a plan in mind and I think, okay, this is the right course of direction and that plan has to change, oh, I am just, I'm beside myself. I don't know what to do because I had a way that this was going to happen. I had a way that I saw this coming and it just totally wrecks me. This is really, really hard when you're raising a toddler. <laughs> I'm pretty sure in the dictionary next to the word toddler, instead of cute and cuddly little child, it just says good luck. <laughs> right? I've had to learn to adapt as best I can to the situation that is presented in front of me. Even if that situation includes a poopy diaper, some drool, and maybe some milk spilled everywhere. I've had to learn in very small increments. And I know many of you have had to learn how to adapt in sometimes leaps and bounds because of what life has thrown at you. And when we're faced with adversity, when we're faced with this plot, this plan of destruction, the things that kind of come up in front of us, we have two options. We either allow it to stop us in our tracks and be a roadblock, or we keep faithfully moving forward. And we seek out what God wants for us. And we pray and we lean on trusted advice to keep moving forward. Now the adversity that Joseph faced continued as his brothers devised another great plan for him. And uh, it's a plan at least to keep him alive. That's our next section. Genesis 37 verses 21 through 28. It reads like this. So but when Reuben, one of the brothers, heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of the Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum and balm and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to the Ishmaelite traders. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. And the brothers agreed. So, when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Happy endings, right? <laughs> Now the following set of verses show us this broken nature of this family that continues. And in the coming weeks, we will hear more about what Joseph does as he overcomes this struggle of being sold into slavery, of being in a town he doesn't know really anybody in, where he has some things kind of well up in him, pride and anger and greed and revenge. We'll find out what Joseph does in these character building moments. But for today, I want to camp on a few things as we wrap this up as our opening uh, look into the life of Joseph. First, and it's pretty, uh, it's been said before, you can't pick your family. 
You can't do it. Joseph had no choice in the matter of the family he was born into, and the same holds true for you and for me. We can't pick our family. However, you do get the choice of how you respond to them. Is it an eye for an eye, or is it more grace and truth? We can't pick our families, but we do have the choice of how we respond to them, good or bad. Second, you can't pick a convenient time for adversity. It's not like there's a spot on the calendar for it. And traditionally, when adversity comes, it blindsides us. And when it does this, it, we immediately go into defense mode. We start putting up walls. We start looking around, saying, okay, where is the next trouble coming? I want to keep my guard up because I don't want to get hit and blindsided again. It makes us defensive. It, it wraps us and it, it, it messes with our mindset. And if you've been in the defense mode for a while, it makes you cynical. Looking where the next thing is coming next, it wears you down. You've been missing out on the freedom that God has for you and for me that he wants us to live in. Because sometimes when we face adversity, when we've been facing adversity for a long time, maybe we've had a family issue or a job issue or, or kids that have uh, just, been, just been a handful and we've faced this adversity, sometimes we're hoping that at some point the world or God or both will pay us back for the struggle that we've been going through. However, the sad reality is this, and what I tell our students this all the time, is that the world owes you nothing. Is that this world owes you nothing. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> this world owes you nothing. And unfortunately, we've been trained to believe that the world, and even God sometimes, owes us whatever we want. Especially when we've been going through adversity especially we've been, when we've been going through hard times. This mindset, this mindset that the world owes us something, leaves us stuck. It leaves us stuck. Stuck believing that the world or God is going to at some point repay us for the struggle that we've been facing. And we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait for something to happen, something good to happen. And when it doesn't come, we feel like we've been wrong because, you know, the world owes us something that we haven't been repaid. And we shake our fists at God and we say, Lord, I thought you were going to repay me here. Come on, where are you at? And we lash out because we feel stuck. There's no end in sight when we're right in the middle of it. We lose hope. And I know many of you have been there before where you look at your situation and go, there's no hope. You feel stuck. Similar to Joseph being stuck in the cistern. There's no hope. You feel stuck. Fortunately for us, there is someone who is in the business of getting people unstuck to see how truly glorious this life can be. This man who has been getting people unstuck has been doing it for years and has a wealth of experience, testimony after testimony of satisfied people that have been unstuck by calling on his name. We read in scripture again and again, and again that at the name of Jesus, stuck people become unstuck. The one that comes to mind is in the gospel of John, a person who was stuck and then became unstuck. It's in chapter 5, where a man who can't walk, he's been stuck, he's been stuck by the pools at Bethesda. And he says, I'm stuck, I can't move, and no one has put me in the pools. Jesus comes along and he says, do you want to get well? We could put that another way. Jesus says, do you want to be unstuck? And the man says, I don't have anybody to put me in the pools. I'm stuck. And Jesus says, no, 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 you're going to be unstuck. You're going to get up, you're going to pick up your mat, and you are going to walk. And that is exactly what happened. Jesus says to the man, you are not stuck anymore. That there is freedom in his name. And I believe that the same is true for us when we're facing adversity, when we're facing trials, when we're facing all the things that this life, this broken life throws our way and we get stuck. That there is a name that we call on that unsticks us. Jesus looks us in the eyes and says, you are not stuck 
anymore. Someone has come to help you through this adversity that you are facing and His name is Jesus. Now the only thing you get to control when adversity in this life starts throwing stuff your way is how you're going to respond to it. You can pick how you are going to respond to adversity. You can't pick your family and you can't pick a convenient time for it. But you can certainly pick how you're going to respond to it. As we're going to read uh, a little bit later in the next coming weeks, Joseph has the opportunity to pick how he responds to this adversity. And the same holds true for us. When trouble comes, are we going to walk faithfully with God? Or are we going to be stuck? I pray that we would call on the name of the one who has generation after generation of experience, testimony after testimony of experience, of getting people unstuck and moving behaviors and moving attitudes and moving thoughts and ideas so that we can experience the freedom that God has for you and for me. My friends, with all we've heard this morning, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we know that trials and adversity come in this life. Whether we're experiencing them now or we're going to or maybe we have in the past and it's left us with a hardened heart. I pray, God, that we would look to you to find freedom in you, to find our hope in you, to find our redemption in you. I pray, God, as we look at our situations, as we look at our families, as we look at our friends and our jobs and every place that you have put us, I pray that you would teach us to walk faithfully in every aspect of life. Because we know in every element that adversity is going to come. We pray, Lord, that we would call on your name, that we would have the strength, that you would put us in the mindset to call on your name, to say, Lord Jesus, come. I don't know what else to do. I am stuck. Lord Jesus, come. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to hear your word. And we pray that it would settle in our minds and hearts. Lord, we give you all praise this day. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.